Good evening and welcome to another installment in the TOG saga. So today, uh, because we've talked about previously the origins and formation of the SVDC, the TOG, and the concepts which went from RBM17 into TOG1, today we're going to talk a little bit about TOG2. We had in previous videos also covered the TOG Amphibian, and here, although that's projecting forward into 1940, we get some kind of idea that concepts of reliance upon just a two pounder gun in a turret, even if it's well armoured, were clearly not going to be suitable for such a large heavy tank. Certainly a larger heavier tank than anyone had built prior to 1940. So, although we have TOG-1 with a big gun in the front of the hull, the design of TOG-1, as we previously covered, was not the tank the TOG guys wanted to build. The tank they wanted, the tank which was to go on to become TOG-2, uh, was a, a different design, uh, along roughly the same sort of shapes, but as we can see it had a slightly different birth story, so we're going to talk about the origins of TOG-2 a little bit, and some of that involves going back over um, 400G, 377G, so let's get on with that. Now, as we go along, I need you to bear in mind a substantial set of overlapping within the timelines here. This is a very confusing time in British tank development. To the extent that numerous times within just my research into the SVDC alone, that it's not entirely clear often which vehicle they're talking about. Because TOG1 and TOG2 are often parallel programs on the subject, there is a substantial amount of overlap between the development. We might want armor for TOG1, excuse me, for TOG2 that's being tested on TOG1, or the transmission for TOG3 being tested on TOG2. Uh, so where there is that overlap, I would say it's difficult, if not impossible, to split those apart. There is also the fact that although TOG1 is the army preferred shape and TOG2 is the SVDC preferred shape, mounting the bigger turret, they're both ancillary competitors, in a way, to the shelled area tank idea, the A-20. That vehicle went on to be A-22. By the time work on TOG-2 starts, the A-20 was being dropped and work being transferred to Vauxhall for that A-20. And that tank, the new infantry tank, Mark IV, despite having less armor, serious liability issues, and then the powered motor, was lighter and shorter than TOG-2, and yet carried the same two-pounder gun. A three-inch howitzer would be mounted in the hull, and I suspect that idea would leak later back into TOG work, as we shall see. At least, in a way, it kills that uh, French 75mm gun mounting idea. So, that French gun is simply too big and clunky, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the origins. We know, or should have been, if you've been following these videos, that the concept for a new heavy tank began in mid to late 1939 and was consolidated in RBM-17 from the Army, calling for a decidedly Mark VIII independent shaped turretless tank. So as we previously mentioned, TOG-1 was not the shape of tank the old gang wanted. What they were considering was a relatively conventional tank, with the engine at the rear, running on full length tracks and mounting a turret. The only really different part would be to push the tracks below the top of the hull to create a wider fighting chamber on top, uh, excuse me, wider fighting chamber inside and more space on top for a turret. Before that, however, we have that even more conventional one, the 300G 477G design. So let's go over that quick. Now, as we've said before, 300G 477G could not meet the requirements of RBM-17, and it wasn't the right kind of tank that the Army was supporting. 300G at the time was TOG-2, but it was little more at the time than an infattened A12 Matilda. It had, after all, the same turret, it was taller, it had a longer body so it could cross longer trenches, and it was capable of fitting still within the English rail gauge. 
Now, sadly, available drawings and discussions of 300G, 477G do not cover all of the armament, but all that we know at the time is that it had an A12 turret, two pounder gun, coaxial uh, machine gun, because those are part of the turret. And then I have to assume some kind of effort for the hull gun, but quite what is unclear. Remember, this vehicle came prior to the SVDC trip to France, so we are prior to the adoption of the French 75mm, and it, therefore it may not have been decided at the time. I personally would err towards a combination of a hull machine gun and possibly something like a 3-inch howitzer, which could lob both high explosive and smoke. The tank still had to contend with the RBM-17 requirements to breach 7 feet of reinforced concrete, and the 2-pounder could not do that, as we've said before. Nothing, in fact, at the time could, and despite attempted revisions to come up with a measure to accommodate that requirement, it was not met um, for, for years. Three hundred G four seven seven G therefore could add little more for the army's capabilities than the existing A twelve could, and it was, if it was anything like the A twelve, then it would have been a pain in the butt to make. A twelve, after all, used complex castings, and a substantial and difficult machining process was needed to manufacture it. For reference here, I'm not referring to the often commented on machining of the armor castings. But the fact the side armour was a pain to machine because it was so hard, it was a pain to fit, and the drive sprockets were one of the hardest parts of the uh, tank. This was a complex one-piece casting that then had to be machined, and machining was at a premium. Tanks, after all, are much more than an armoured box, so tankophiles who focus only on this um, simple trinity idea of firepower, mobility and armour really are missing much more serious and often more important issues usually relating to production and using the damn things. So I would say that there's a chance that the lessons from the non-acceptance of TOG2, the 300G477G TOG2 at the time, probably affected a lot of the simplification decisions later on relating to the design and production as producibility would be one of the strongest points in favour of the TOG design work, and something one step above and beyond the capabilities offered by A20 and its as yet unborn offspring A22. We also get a good clue as to what armament was going to be wanted as the primary gun. No longer was the two-pounder gun used on a majority of British tanks and a perfectly adequate um, gun in its own right for knocking holes in enemy tanks. But here, they wanted a bigger gun, and it was going to be a six-pounder. Why a six-pounder? Well, specifically mentioned as a defect of the A20 design was that it could not mount such a big gun. Therefore, if you see yourself as some kind of potential competitor to that, you want your tank to do something that the others definitely cannot, in this case, take a six-pounder. But more so, it's simply a more capable gun. It fires a bigger shot, penetrate more armor, and deliver um, a good high-explosive shell. So whether it's specifically a defect of the A20 that the design couldn't mount that, that I came on, that was um, undoubtedly a player within the decision. Given the need for a large hull gun, as yet undecided, remember the video on the TOG Citadel concept? We can now project the SVDC into consideration of a new turret gun in the six pounder size to outdo anything else on offer and carry this big hull gun. At the end of October 1939, this hull gun was still, remember, being potentially the British 25 pounder field gun which, quite honestly, is a better choice than ideas of that enormous 60-pounder gun or even a shortened version of it, and frankly, even the uh, eventual choice, the French 75mm. We also know that as early as November 1939 that the SVDC received drawings of the 3-inch 20 hundredweight anti-aircraft gun too, which, which supports that gun being considered as an option as a potential hull gun. This would be very important later on because that gun gets considered for use in the turret. All of these options, however, required a very different tank to that offered by 300G, 477G. 
It could not be in the shape of A20, so it brought the team full circle back to their original plan. Now we get the research trip to France, remember, and here the SVDC got their first chance to really look at heavy tanks. And remember, at the time, they were being tasked with TOG-1 as RBM-17 and nothing else, whilst all the time simultaneously fighting to get a turret as a foot in the door to the redesign. After all, if they could persuade the army to adopt a turret on TOG-1, then there'd be no need for an all-round track, because you can't simply get the unditching gear past the turret, and therefore there's no reason not to adopt the far better and the original depressed track concept. We will come back to engines for all this in a dedicated video, and probably too have to review all the guns considered as well, because there's just so many. But engine-wise at this time, there's now almost a separate line of TOG work going on to find a power unit the size uh, needed for a heavy tank. And at the time, this is going to be something in the region of a 600 horsepower unit, simply because that's the capabilities of the time. The engine would have to be diesel, because that was the preference of everybody for safety reasons, because it's less flammable. And hopefully something simple to make. And really this is the forte of Sir Harry Ricardo. And the team would have to come to rely on his TP12 high-speed diesel, whilst at the same time looking further ahead with an engine and a power range up to about a thousand horsepower. So you can imagine that in 1940, if they happen to have on hand this thousand horsepower diesel engine, just how much more capable this idea of this huge TOG would really have been. Until the TP-12 was ready, however, they would be stuck using definitely the second choice of engine and here this would be the Thornycroft RY12 petrol engine. So through December 1939 and into January 1940 the value of the depressed track over the all-round track and the already rejected 300G TOG2 idea was still being used as the model from which to make TOG-2 more viable, although the weight had now grown to 50 tonnes, and the additional armour would add 2 to 3 tonnes more. The speculation here would be that it's grown to 50 tonnes because they've got to have a larger space in which to plan to put this TP-12 engine. Add a bit of extra armour as well to accommodate that, and we've added 2 to 3 tonnes. The amended TOG-2 vehicle here was then rejected in February by the army. The army was still stuck in the mud, uh, excuse the pun, demanding an all-round track machine and the SVDC would have to go back and work on amending the design for what would be a new TOG-2. Um, this is still February 1940 and now the weight had grown again to 55 tons. Now if we start at 50 tons because we're now bigger um, with this new TP-12 engine, we're adding more armor, and now we go to the army and they, their requirements change the weight to 55 tons, the vehicle is getting bigger, and as it gets bigger, we need to add more armor to um, protect it across its full length. And thus the shape of the vehicle is in one way dictated by the TP-12 engine because it's so high, but it's also dictated by the requirements. But just as an indication of the space in which you have to play in this longer vehicle. This new TOG-2, the space inside for the engine and transmission, the volume is 9 foot 6 wide, 5 foot 3 high and 19 feet long. That's 2.89 by 1.6 by 5.79 meters, 26.8 cubic meters, just for the power unit, just for the power unit, 26.8 cubic meters. So just for amusement, by the way, that means a Type 1 VW Beetle would fit completely inside the uh, engine bay of the TOG. As work on TOG 1 commenced through spring 1940, there were concerns over the transmission. Stern had opted for an electrical transmission because even back in World War I, he had been greatly impressed by the... Um, 
electrical transmission that had been tested. Even though that had not worked, it clearly had the potential, and he clearly liked it as well. But Mr. Wilson did not like it. Uh, Walter Wilson uh, was not in favour of that. He preferred mechanical-type transmissions. Other members of the SVDC preferred hydraulic transmissions. So then we're going to get into work experimented with different types of transmission to find the best solution, both in size, simplicity, weight and volume, uh, for a heavy tank. On the 22nd of March 1940, as options around this were being discussed and thoughts of changing TOG 1 were going on, instructions were sent from Stern to Messrs. William Foster & Co. for a new model of tank. But it wasn't TOG 2. No, it, you might think it was TOG 2, but even though this was the second or third iteration of ideas, but it was in fact just TOG 1 with a turret. So it wasn't actually a new tank at all. This was a success in a way, a vindication for Stern SVDC's work to persuade the army that a turretless tank was no use at all, um, and that if they can get this turret onto the RBM-17 style TOG-1, then obviously they can um, get rid of the uh, tracks over the top, dispense with the sponsons, things like that, one step at a time perhaps. The mock-up for this now turreted TOG-1 was shown off at the end of March, and during this time, Stern kept himself busy pressing his case hard, not only for more and heavier tanks, quite correctly so, but also for some rationalisation of design and development with the tank board to oversee work in place of the mechanisation board. The mechanisation board, he felt, had uh, lounged around in recent years in an internal bubble of fiddling with various light cruisers, which were much of a muchness and offered relatively little difference between themselves. And in that regard, too, he was right, because the tank board would indeed be set up. But there was also problems at this time, many of which were to foreshadow a lot of the work on TOG 2, and cause much head-scratching. And that was, at the time, the decision to divert production on TP-12 engines to Winston Churchill's WIM project, the Cultivator Machine. And the Cultivator is simply a large, it's described as a trench digging machine, but it's not actually a trench digging machine. It just happens to dig a trench as it moves. It's actually an assault machine. Um, I'll definitely have to cover that um, individually because I keep hearing it described incorrectly. Uh, but even so, Stern would have to ensure that he got what he needed for his project while alternative engines were sort of. The TP-12s were now going to be diverted to the Naval Land Equipment um, Division for their cultivator machines or uh, other uh, giant projects. Then Stern and the SVDC would have to find another engine, which is kind of annoying as that's Mr. Ricardo's engine and he's on the SVDC. You can see how they might feel slighted by this. So, as of April 1940, we have a note saying that TOG-1 was now in the 60 to 70 ton range. Remember, let's step back, TOG-2, modified from that 300G, 477G, had now grown to about 55 tons. TOG-1 is already topping 60 tons, maybe as much as 70 tons. And this gives us a good indication of the future weight of TOG-2 at the time. Top 2 being the tank, Stern was pressing Winston Churchill to order that very month. Because if he orders this in April 1940, quantities of Top 2 would be available in time for summer 1941. That did not happen. The situation into April and May 1940 was being changed and it wasn't being changed as a result of the SVDC, it was being changed as a result of the Germans with the invasion of France. And this changing situation was clearly having an effect on the government, who suddenly realised that this war was very, very real. On the 6th of May 1940, in fact, it was confirmed that two tanks, TOG-1 and TOG-2, were uh, to be produced. As a point of note here, of, uh, whether to use Arabic or Roman numerals, the SVDC clearly preferred Arabic numbers, and the Ministry and Army the latter. So, officially, I guess, if we're referring on paper to TOG-1, we should write it not as TOG-1, but as TOG-I, and TOG-2 as TOG-II. Make of that what you will. I personally prefer the SVDC method, uh, using 
numbers instead of numerals. Anyway, we start to get ideas of what TOG2 at this time has now become. And honestly, it's less than amazing. It's very, very similar to TOG1, other than obviously where the track goes. Like TOG1, it has a 75mm gun in the whole front. Like TOG1, it has World War I style stamped and bolted track plates. And like TOG1, now amended, it has a turret. The big difference here is that the turret is now going to be much bigger. Bigger than that on the A12, because it's got more space, and bigger than that on offered by the A20. If big enough, in fact, to carry a triple mounting of a 3-inch howitzer, a 2-pound gun, and a Baser machine gun. We also know at the time, at this time, excuse me, that it was to have 63 millimeters of side armor. The side armor was therefore basically what the front of the A20, this is, A20 remember is this new infantry tank, the new infantry Mark IV that's uh, being spawned. But there was clearly not yet a decision on the frontal armor for TOG2, other than it was going to be more than 63 millimeters and would have to be proof against six pounder shot. And we know that it has to be more than 63 millimeters because the front of A20 was not proof against six pounder shot and 63 millimeters isn't proof against six pounder shot. So if the front of TOG2 is going to be proof against six pounder shot, it has to be more than 63 millimeters. So that protection against six pounder shot was now being considered the minimum a heavy tank was going to need. And in fact, something that A20 was hopelessly unable to provide. So in fact, three prototypes were approved this month, TOG1 and TOG2. TOG1 already underway, and the new TOG2, and hopefully a rationalized tank using all of the knowledge of both programs to be TOG3. We'll come back to that. Firing trials for the six-pounder gun in December 1939 showed it to be a superior anti-tank gun to the two-pounder, and during those trials, armor up to four inches, so uh, 101.6 millimeters thick, was used, indicating the maximum thickness of armor being considered up to that point for this uh, new rationalized tank, and presumably for TOG-2. We also get to see at this time the shape of TOG-2 as a 1 16th scale model, uh, which was completed and presented to the tank board. The very tank board Stern had pressed for and helped set up. And on top of this, work on a new electrical transmission was progressing nicely as well. Transmission-wise, like firepower, will undoubtedly have to be a video in its own right, as it's really convoluted, but it's also crucial to this heavy tank program, and heavy tanks in general when it's done right. The one downside, however, uh, was that this was a clear limit on Stern's work. But the three prototypes have been authorised, and now, remember, he's got this added pressure that the TP-12 engines have been diverted to the Cultivator project. He's got two prototypes on the go. He wants to make sure that this third prototype is going to be you know, the thing that is picked. As you would, you don't want to squander this opportunity. So, TOG-1, TOG-I, I guess, uh, officially was the RBM-17 modified machine, and TOG-2, TOG-II, uh, I'm not going to say TOG I, that's annoying. Uh, should be followed by a fully fledged intermediary design ready for production with minor changes as TOG 3. It would also have synthesized all of the ideas to that point. So it would have heavy armor, a strong gun, and a new large turret, depressed track, a high performance diesel engine of an undetermined type, uh, and an as yet undetermined but probably high efficient transmission of the hydraulic type, although I can't help think that Stern wanted this electrical transmission to be the success, because that's what he wanted. So testing for that transmission, that's the high-efficiency uh, high hydraulic one, uh, was to be the purpose of TOG3, and Stern clearly saw an opportunity to do even better, but also salvage a vehicle from the shambles of this RBM-17 TOG1, which quite honestly he must have felt was one prototype almost stolen from him by the army's insistence on this design. So rather than make TOG3 just to test a hydraulic transmission, he would keep TOG3 back 
to synthesize those ideas and use TOG1 as the test bed for TOG3. So what he would do is we would replace the transmission system, the electrical transmission system in TOG1, which wasn't working very well, with a new hydraulic system for what was going to be TOG3 into TOG1, and we're just going to change the name to TOG1A, therefore we still only technically made two prototypes with three transmissions, and now we've saved our TOG3 back. So we've got three for the price of two, we get to allow a TOG3 to be made available later, and we'll deal with TOG3 and <laughs> TOG4 and whatever else, and all the other TOGs in another video. What is also meant was more freedom for TOG2 now to be used as a testing vehicle for ideas. And that is certainly reflected in the work done on TOG2. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too confusing, but this is a really good point to draw this episode to a close. As by the end of May and into June 1940, not only do we have TOG1 off as a project, and now going to be TOG1A, eh? but we also have TOG2 approved. This coincidence with the a20 to A22 being finally drawn up alongside the hydraulic TOG. Remember, hydraulic TOG is formerly TOG3 and is now being put into TOG1 to become TOG1A. So let's end here uh, this month, the same month of the disaster of Dunkirk. The month when perhaps more than others, TOG work was at its most important. The month when the A22 was finally starting its troubled birth from its even more troubled forebear. And we'll end with just a quick summary of the stats of these three TOGs. Remember, we're, we're not talking about the amphibian yet. TOG 1, 68 tons with 25 tons of armor. TOG 2, 62 tons with 25 tons of armor. TOG 1, six, 34 feet 6 inches long. TOG 2, likewise. TOG 1, 600 horsepower engine with electrical transmission. TOG 2, 600 horsepower with electrical transmission because they were still thinking of putting a new um, electrical transmission into it by the time it was built that would not happen tog one a12 turret two pound gun baser four side baser machine guns and a front hull gun tog two six pound gun four machine guns and a, a large turret tog three now renamed tog one a would be as TOG1 dimension-wise, but fitted with a hydraulic transmission. So I hope that was clear and has made the project a, as easy to understand as possible. I hope this was informative. It's gone on a bit longer than I wanted to. So thank you very much for your time. If you like this video and wish to support my work, this channel, my books, um, my research, then please consider supporting me through Patreon. And be sure to check out FWD uh, publishing on Facebook and WordPress and maybe please take a look at my books available on my author page at Amazon.com with all sorts of things from the tea tray mine protection for the Sherman tank to British work on Zimmerit and my latest book on wading and waterproofing work uh, with a focus emphasizing on the necessary work running up to D-Day in 1944. Thank you very much. Good night.